The program is getting quite challenging now, don't you agree? Well, for a respite, let's talk for a minute about some commonly mispronounced words. You just heard one of them. Respite, spelled R-E-S-P-I-T-E. Respite is often mispronounced respite. A respite is an interval of rest or relief, a lull, hiatus, as a vacation is a respite from work. Take care to stress this word on the first syllable, respite. Throughout the Verbal Advantage program, have you noticed how I've been pronouncing the word program? Many speakers today slur the gram and say program. Current dictionaries now countenance this slurred pronunciation, so I can't say categorically that it's wrong, but I can state my dogmatic opinion. Program is illogical and sloppy. The vast majority of speakers don't slur the gram in telegram, anagram, cryptogram, monogram, kilogram, milligram, and diagram, so it only makes sense to be consistent and preserve the gram in program. One of the most common speaking errors is misplacing the accent or stress in a word. Misplaced accents are rife among educated speakers today. Just for fun, try this little test. Do you say influence or influence? Affluent or affluent? Superfluous or superfluous? Preferable or preferable? Comparable or comparable? Formidable or formidable? Integral or integral? Hospitable or hospitable? Applicable or applicable? And last but not least, do you say exquisite or exquisite? In every case, my first pronunciation of each word was the proper one. If you check these words in a dictionary, you will find some of the second pronunciations listed, simply because so many speakers now misplace the accent in these words that dictionary editors feel compelled to record the practice. However, take it from me. Influence, exquisite, preferable, and all the rest are either trendy or flat-out wrong. The traditional and preferred pronunciations are influence, affluent, superfluous, preferable, comparable, formidable, integral, hospitable, applicable, and exquisite. Now, let me ask you this. When you make a mistake, do you err or do you err? Properly, the verb to err, spelled E-R-R, should rhyme with sir, not with hair. Dictionaries have recorded pronunciation for about 200 years. The variant air did not appear in a dictionary until the 1960s. Since then, it has become the dominant pronunciation. Although some commentators argue in favor of air on the grounds that it links the verb phonically with the noun error, many cultivated speakers and current authorities still prefer er, and I stand firmly with them. Now it's up to you to decide. Do you prefer to err or err? If you're clever and you prefer to be right, then answer me this. When management and labor try to hammer out a contract, would you say they are engaged in negotiations or in negotiations? When people have strong opposing views on an issue, would you describe the issue as controversial or controversial? If you would have said negotiations and controversial, ask yourself this. Have you always pronounced these words like that, or did you unconsciously change your pronunciation at some point because you heard so many friends, co-workers, and broadcasters pronouncing them that way? Negotiate and controversial are vogue pronunciations, by which I mean they are trendy and pseudo-sophisticated. To borrow a phrase from the great authority on language, H.W. Fowler, they owe their vogue or popularity to the joy of showing that one has acquired them. Controversial entered the limelight, or perhaps I should say slimelight, in the 1970s. Negotiate has been slithering around only since the mid-1980s. 
Why have so many people suddenly decided to say negotiate and controversial? Beats me. All I know is that there is no good reason to follow the herd and adopt these affected pronunciations. Saying controversial and negotiate is like saying special for special or substantial for substantial. Stick with controversial and negotiate, which have served us for generations, and no one will ever stick it to you. And that goes for the word species, too. The alternative pronunciation, species, now used by many educated speakers, has been heard for about 50 years. The traditional pronunciation, species, has been around since the word came into the language in the 14th century. Nevertheless, because of its popularity today among the over-refined, species is now recognized by current dictionaries. Not one, however, lists it first. That makes my heart glad, for to my ear this sibilant species sounds socially ambitious and intellectually superficial. In my opinion, species is just too precious for words. As you can see, when it comes to pronunciation, I am a creature of an altogether different species. I have my own program. I don't think all pronunciations are comparable. I believe some are preferable to others. When I hear someone err, it hurts my exquisitely sensitive ears. I have formidable opinions. I am not often willing to negotiate, and I am certainly not afraid of being controversial. All that may not make me popular or affluent, but at least I've done my homework and I know what I'm talking about. If you choose to follow my advice on pronunciation, no one can rightfully accuse you of slovenly speech. And if someone ever does have the audacity to criticize any pronunciation you learn from me, just smile and advise that poor, verbally disadvantaged person to call 1-800-765-5511 and order this program. But that's enough pontification about pronunciation. Now let's take a look at some commonly confused words. First, consider the verbs to imply and to infer which hordes of well-educated people have a murderous time distinguishing. To imply is to suggest, hint, indicate indirectly. A person may say one thing and imply another. Or someone may think you are implying something when you are not. For example, if you ask a co-worker out for lunch, the person may think you are implying, hinting, that you want to get intimate when all you want is some company so you don't have to stare at the wall while you chew. To infer means to deduce, conclude, draw a conclusion. You can infer, draw a logical conclusion, from evidence or known facts. You can also infer something from what someone implies. For example, if a client says he needs to think about an offer you have just made, he might be implying that he is unhappy with it, and you might infer that he may go to someone else. As Theodore Bernstein puts it, the implier is the pitcher, the inferrer is the catcher. Someone who implies throws out a hint, a suggestion. Someone who infers catches that suggestion and makes a conclusion, deduction. Now let's differentiate between the words disinterested and uninterested. No one ever has a problem with uninterested. It simply means not interested. The trouble starts when people use disinterested to mean the same thing as uninterested. Disinterested means impartial, unbiased, not influenced by selfish motives. In court, you want a disinterested judge, not an uninterested one. And at work, you want a disinterested boss, a fair, impartial boss, not an uninterested one. Finally, let's distinguish between the words anxious and eager. Eager is rarely misused, but you will often hear anxious used in place of eager in such phrases as, Mike is anxious to see the new movie, or Amanda was anxious to get a promotion. Anxious means full of anxiety, worried, nervous, concerned. Eager means showing keen interest or impatient desire. In his helpful guide, The Appropriate Word, usage commentator J.N. Hook 
explains that we are anxious, worried, about harmful things that may happen, eager about things we want to happen. Thus, Mike should be eager to see the new movie, but anxious about whether he'll be able to get a good seat. And Amanda should be eager to get a promotion, but anxious about handling the greater responsibility of the job. And now, after that long-winded lecture on pronunciation and usage, I'll bet you're eager to learn more words. So before you get anxious, we shall return to the verbal advantage vocabulary for the final 10 keywords in Level 4.